to accomplish our God-given destiny, we're going to have to go against the flow of this world system. You are sons and daughters of the Most High God. Session four, we are already halfway through. Can you believe it? Talking about the beta Satan now. I really want to amplify what I talked about last session and really zero and hone in on this because if you don't really get the heart of this, you're really not going to be free from offense. So I want, I want to go to Romans chapter 12 is, is first thing I want to do. I want to look at the words that Paul the apostle wrote, okay? Paul said, repay. Everybody say, repay. repay. No one evil for evil. Beloved, do not avenge yourselves. Now, is that a recommendation? No. Is it a suggestion? No. It's a command. Okay? Now, you are going to find all throughout Scripture, and I'm, I'm even going to show you a few of these Scriptures in a minute, that God considers it an unrighteous thing when we avenge ourselves. Did you hear what I just said? Unrighteous thing when we avenge ourselves. He considers it a righteous thing for him to avenge us. All right? So he says, but rather give place to wrath, for it is written, vengeance or revenge is mine. I will repay. That is God's promise. I'll repay. Now, you know what the repay may be sometimes? You think in judgment, God's going to bring calamity on his person, and maybe they get saved. I will repay, says the Lord. Now, I want to prove to you this is not a light manner. I find out that we ministers get in trouble when we shout what God whispers. And we whisper what he shouts. You will notice Jesus said there are weightier matters of the word of God. He said to the Pharisees, you pay your tithes of your anise, mint, and cumin, but you've neglected the weightier matters, which is justice, faith, and mercy. I'm going to show you this is a weighty matter. This is why I'm harping on this, okay, in a good way. Look, look, look at these scriptures. Uh, this is Proverbs 20, 22. Don't say, I will get even for this wrong. Wait for the Lord to handle the matter. That's powerful, isn't it? Look at this one. The Lord says, am I not storing up these things, sealing them away in my treasury? I will take revenge. I will pay them back in due time. Their feet will slip. Their day of disaster will arrive and their destiny will will overtake them. That is exactly what David quoted to Abishai in the last uh, session that I shared with you. Let me show you this one. Proverbs, and don't say to your neighbor, now I can pay them back for what they've done to me. I'll get even with them. Are, are, are you starting to get this? Now, I don't want Paul to just comment on this. I want to go to another New Testament writer. I want to go to Peter. Look what Peter says. Peter says, servants. Everybody say servants. servants. All right, that could be nowadays employees, students, team members, etc. All right, be submissive. This is where we really ended last session. To your masters. Who's your masters? Employers, teachers, managers, team leaders, coaches, etc. Right? With all fear, not only to the good and gentle, and we all love being submitted to good and gentle leaders. Yeah. And they're very needed for our growth, okay? But also to the harsh. Now, one day I'm reading this and I go, what? What? Well, now, wait a minute. This is the New King James Version. Maybe they got a little extreme with this translation. So what I did is I went to the concordances looking for relief. And so the first place I went to was Thayer's. And I looked up that word for harsh. It's the Greek word skolios. And Thayer's defines this word as crooked, perverse, wicked, and unfair. 
I said, oh man, he missed it. So I went to vines, okay? Vines defines this word as tyrannical or unjust leaders. So I went to other sources and I found the word dishonest, cruel, and unreasonable. And I thought, wait a minute. God, you are telling me your child to be submitted to a crooked, perverse, wicked, unfair, tyrannical, dishonest, cruel, unreasonable, unjust leader? God, are you a child abuser? I mean, this is what's going through my mind. But yet that's what it says. Now, listen, when you read things like this, can I tell you, I've really enjoyed this. It's, it's comical. People get to these scriptures and they read over them real fast. And they kind of pretend like they don't exist. Now, can I tell you honestly, these are the scriptures I love because it makes no sense to me. And I realize that I've got a choice. I can dismiss it and ignore it, or I can address it and say, God, I'm going to believe this whether I understand it or not. And how many of you know that's the fear of the Lord? And the fear of the Lord is the beginning of understanding. That's why people have said to me in the past, they've said, where do you get these things from? I just have chosen to believe what I read, not read into the Bible what I already believe. Okay? Are you hearing what I'm saying? All right. So I, I, want, to, I want to tell you, it's going to get worse before it gets better. Okay, so let me just brace you, all right? But this is going to get good. You're, it's going to get good, all right? So let's keep reading what Peter says. He says, for God is pleased. Everybody say, I want to please God. All right, here's how you do it. When, when conscious of his will, you patiently endure unjust treatment. Oh my gosh, this is getting worse. If you suffer for doing good and endure it patiently, God is pleased with you. So, so you understand what God is saying? You do what's right, and you get punished for doing what's wrong, and you endure it patiently. God's pleased with that? Oh, it gets even better. Keep going. For even to this you were called. Everybody say, this is my calling. My calling. Okay, so, you know, so I have people all the time saying, what am I called to do? I mean, John, I've been praying about what I'm called to do. This is it. <laughs> what, 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 what do you mean this is my, this is my calling? You're called by God to handle unfair treatment patiently and justly. That's your calling. For even in this you are called, it is inseparable from your vocation. This is the Amplified. For Christ, Jesus Christ, also suffered for you, leaving you his personal example so that you should follow in his footsteps. Now, personal example, I got to go to Mark 15 to get it. Jesus is standing in a court of law. It's the highest court of the land. It's the Supreme Court. Okay? Here are the most influential men in the whole nation. You got to remember, Pharisees and Sadducees weren't just religious leaders. They were governmental leaders because Rome would allow a territory to govern itself still. But this is the highest court of the law, the Supreme Court, the Roman Supreme Court of, of, of Israel, and the number one guy from Rome is on that judgment seat. These are the most influential men in the country, and they are saying all kinds of lies about Jesus. There's not a truth in what they're saying. And the chief priests accused Jesus of many things. Now look at this. But he answered nothing. This is a court of law. They're lying about him. They're slandering him. And he just says nothing. Watch this. Then Pilate, that's the Roman governor, asked him again. So he's already asked him this the first time. Saying, do you answer nothing? See how many things they testify against you. But Jesus still answered nothing so that Pilate marveled. Now everybody say Pilate marveled. Pilate marveled. Why is Pilate marveling? Because he knows it's the Supreme Court. He knows there's no higher, higher court they can appeal to. He's watched men many, many times in the same situation that were being accused, and they were frantically defending themselves. Now he's watching a man who he knows is innocent. His wife had a dream and said, he's an innocent, godly man. Don't touch him. If you look at what he wrote on the cross, he, he, Pilate made a sign, the king of the Jews. The priest said, no, 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 say that he said he was the king of the Jews. And Pilate said, uh-uh, what I've written, I've written. Pilate knows he's a godly man. He's watching now an innocent man, not a criminal. He's usually used to watching criminals defend themselves. He's watching this innocent man, 
and he knows they're saying lies about him. And so Pilate can't even stand any longer, and he stops, and he says, Jesus, what are you going to say about all this? And Jesus says nothing. Why is Jesus saying nothing? Peter tells us. This is his personal example. He never sinned nor ever deceived anyone. He did not retaliate when he was insulted nor threaten revenge when he suffered. He left his case in the hands of God who always judges fairly. Jesus left his case in the hands of God who judges fairly. Years ago, I was a youth pastor for a very large church. Uh, I remember when I became uh, the youth pastor, I had never done any kind of pastoring before, and I was asked to come on staff of one of the fastest, most well-known churches in America. And I remember I was so concerned about becoming youth pastor for this very well-known church that it caused me to really dig in. And I remember the Lord said to me, the reason I chose you to do this is because you won't bring your brief briefcase in a plan. Back then we carried briefcases. Don't do that anymore, thank God, because we have our Apple computers. But anyway, uh, he said, but you'll have to seek me. So I start seeking God. And I remember what the Lord said to me. He said, don't make your youth group all about activities. Don't win them. The previous youth pastor, what he did is he built a whole youth group on activities, and it never grew past 100, even though it was a massive church. We didn't have massive youth groups back then like we do today. And so the Lord said to me, he said, I want you to treat them like adults because a person becomes an adult in my eyes, adolescence at 13. A Jewish man goes through bar mitzvah at 13, not 21. He said, you treat them like adults. I want you to preach. I want you to pray. And I want you to worship. That's your emphasis. And then have activities as kind of a fun thing. And so I started preaching. And you know what God was having me preach? Messages on holiness. Deny yourself. Take up your cross. Follow Jesus. Right? Well, there's a young man sitting in my, in my youth group who his dad just so happened to be my boss. He was the administrative pastor. I was the youth pastor. There was about 12, 11 or 12 of us pastors on this team, and we reported to three executive pastors, and one of them was this administrative pastor. Well, his son's in my youth group, and he's getting so fired up at what we're preaching. And one night he comes and cries to my wife, and she said, Miss Lisa, how can I live the life Pastor John's preaching to us? When my mom and dad are doing this at home, this at home, this at home, and this at home. And my wife was shocked beyond measure because this is my boss. And my wife just looks at him, and Lisa's so wise. She said, just live the life that the Word of God says, and don't worry about your parents. Your parents are not your concern, okay? They're your authority. They're your parents. You just live the life that you know the Bible says you're supposed to live and leave them with God. So my wife was so smart. Well, he got his eye against me from that moment forward. I mean, he was like out to destroy me. And for the next year and a half, he literally started going after me and literally would write emails and employees would come up and say, uh, why doesn't he just put your husband's name on this email? Um, and finally, what happened was he started putting a wedge between me and our senior pastor. And I went four solid months where I could not get an appointment with the pastor. He blocked it. And he started telling the pastor things that I was doing and saying that I was not doing and saying and started telling me things the senior pastor was saying about me that he wasn't saying. And he started driving this huge wedge between me and the senior pastor. Well, finally, the senior pastor made the decision. I'm firing John. He gets up in front of Sunday morning service and says there's going to be a massive change in the youth group. I need to meet with all the parents and all the youth of the church Tuesday night. I know the change because... I have my first meeting with the senior pastor on Monday morning, and I'm getting fired. How do I know that? Two of the pastor's brothers told me, John, you better brace yourself. On Monday morning, you're getting fired. I figured that was pretty good authority, his two brothers. So the whole weekend, I remember Lisa kept saying, what are you going to do? I said, I'm not going to do anything. I said, God is the one that sent me here. God is the one that sent us here. I said, God is going to have to be the one that defends us. And so... Monday morning comes, we walk into the senior pastor's office. He, the administrative pastor, and one other senior executive pastor were supposed to be there with the senior, and I was going to get fired. Well, when I walked in, to our surprise, Lisa and I walked in, it was just the senior pastor. And the senior pastor looked at me and says, why does he want you fired so bad? I said, I don't know. He said, well, you need to figure it out because I, I don't want dissension in my staff. I, he said, figure it out. I said, okay. And he said, John, you have access to me anytime you want. Just call my assistant and make an appointment. You can see me. So in the last minute, God delivered me and, and, and freed me. So 
A month later, um, I got some evidence against this guy that I'll never forget. This evidence could have got him fired. He had lied to another organization, blatant lie. I had the written evidence of it. So I made an appointment with a senior pastor. I'm going to show him what this guy did. And I thought, now the senior pastor is going to really understand what kind of guy he is. Because not only was he trying to fire me, he was trying to fire the children's pastor and the junior high pastor. He was out after all three of us, okay? So I thought, I'm going to protect these guys. I'm going to protect the staff because this guy is a tyrant. And so I'm praying that morning, and I keep saying, now, God, how do I share this? Do I go in and just say what the guy's doing, or do I just show the senior pastor the letter and let the letter speak for itself? And I couldn't get any peace. And so I keep praying, I keep praying, I get no peace. So fine, after 30 minutes of praying about this, I look up and I go, God, you don't want me to share this with him. And the peace of God goes, <laughs> just like that. We see, I saw later on that I was really trying to defend myself and prove myself right, not protect the junior high pastor, okay? Yeah, God has a way of exposing our own motives. But anyway, so about a month later, I'm out praying on the church grounds because I used to come about an hour and a half before our office opened up, and I just pray on the church grounds, right? And it's in the midst of trees, and I see this guy pull up in his reserved parking spot. And when I see him pull up, the Holy Spirit said to me, I want you to go to him, and I want you to apologize. I said, what? Me apologize to him? He's been trying to destroy my life. I said, he should apologize to me. And the Lord said, nothing. So I start praying about something else. I remember I prayed for for China and for Bolivia. And you talk about dry, you talk about the presence of God leaving your prayer closet. So after 10 minutes of struggling with no presence of God, I said, God, what are you saying to me? He said, son, I want you to go to him and apologize. I thought, oh my God. I said, Lord, what do I say? And the Lord showed me. And, and, and he really did. So I walked into his office that day and I looked at him. He was quite surprised I made an appointment because I avoided him. I said, I owe you an apology. I've been judgmental of you. I, I'm wrong. And my attitude's been totally wrong. He goes, I forgive you. Now, we really didn't connect in that meeting, but his attacks against me subsided. Six months later, I was out of town for one week, and I was actually in Trinidad, and everything the guy was doing got exposed. He was fired immediately. What he was doing was so much worse than I even thought that it was filed with a lawyer's office, and they said, if you ever slander the church, we will press charges. He could have gone to jail. God vindicated me in one weekend with me not even being there. And do you know what happened? I ended up preaching many, many times at the, scene, at the head services of that church years later. Do you or someone you know speak a language other than English? Do you want more inspired teaching from John and Lisa Bevere? Go on to cloudlibrary.org, free video streaming and resource download website. Select your language. Select your resource from the extensive library ebooks, video messages, audiobooks and teaching, TV shows, Bibles, and more. Learn more. Go to cloudlibrary.org. God has called you to do. Here we go again. This is your calling. Do you understand? When you get insulted, when you get unfairly treated, you have an opportunity to pay back with a blessing, to do good. Are you seeing this? Keep reading. It's amazing. Knowing that you were called to this. Why were we called to this? That you may inherit a blessing. So you know what that means? The next time you are unfairly treated, the next time you are insulted, the next time somebody does something evil against you, you can dance, jump up and down, shout, put on a Hillsong CD, dance all over the house. Why? Because God is setting you up to get blessed if you handle it correctly. What happens if you don't handle it correctly? God just says, you want to defend yourself? I'll just stand back and let you do it. See, what people don't understand is we can defend ourselves, and we can even win, but there's a little uh on the inside. What's the little uh? You missed out on the blessing. You missed out on the opportunity to grow in character. You didn't need to defend yourself. You still with me? Yes. There's a businessman that walked up to me. I was preaching in South Florida. 
And uh, I remember when I was done ministering one night, this guy comes up, and he's sharp. You could tell, man, this guy's sharp. He's, he's, I'd say, late 30s, early 40s, and he comes up to me, and I can tell he's, he's well off. And he, um, he looks at me, and he says, can I talk to you for a few minutes? I said, sure. He said, um, I own a company here in South Florida that we make specialized fountains for landscaping. And he said, one of our biggest companies that we work for is the largest landscaping company in all of South Florida. He said, we've done some jobs for them. And he said, we had done some jobs. And he said, they owed my company $110,000, excuse me, $114,000. And he said, John, for that, 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 that's a lot of money for us, for my small company. And he said, and they weren't paying it. And he said, I knew they had the money to pay it. And he said, every day, I kept getting angrier and angrier. He said, I started bad-mouthing that company to my employees. I'd make comments about them. He said, I would bad-mouth them at home. He said, and then I heard your message on how to handle unfair treatment. And he said, I realized I was sinning against God. By bad-mouthing him, picking up the offense, I realized I had picked up the offense. I was constantly telling my side of the story, constantly telling people how badly I was being treated. He said, I repented before God when I heard your message. And he said, I went to my, all, my, all my employees, which he said, it wasn't a, it's not a large company. And he said, I'm wrong for bad-mouthing this company. He said, I went to my family, I told him. He said, then I got in my car and I drove 30 minutes and I went with the owner of this massive landscaping company. And he said, I sat down with him and he said, you know, I have, um, I've criticized you to my employees. I've criticized you even to my family. I've been offended. I'm so sorry. He said, uh, uh, would you forgive me? Now, the, he said, John, I don't even know if the guy's a Christian. He said, I just talked to him like that. And the guy said, okay, fine. And he said, then I looked at the guy and he said, you know, according to our records, you owe us 114000 but you know what? You just pay us whatever you feel our work has been worth to you, and you send it whenever you're ready. I just want you to know everything's good. So he said, I left the meeting. He said, a week later, I got a check in the mail from the company. He said it was for $11,000. See, it doesn't work. <laughs> Do you understand? They owed him $114,000. They sent him an $11,000 check. So he looked at me and he said, John, two and a half weeks later, my company got the largest job we've ever gotten before. Never even come close to this. We got a two and a half million dollar job. And he said, four weeks later, we got a seven million dollar job. Does God repay? Yeah. Maybe not the way you think it's going to be repaid. See, this is what Jesus had to do. I remember there was a person that I kept reaching out to, and every time I'd reach out to them, they'd slap me back in the face. I'd do nice things. They'd slap me back in the face. I was like, I got so frustrated one day. I just went to the gym, and I said, God, you're going to have to talk to me now. And the Lord said, you need to place faith in my love. He said, I said, whatever you sow, you'll reap. You sow to the Spirit, you'll reap of the Spirit life. You'll sow to the flesh, you'll reap of the flesh corruption. He said, the problem is you're looking for your harvest to come back to the person you're sowing into. He said, you have to trust that when you sow love, you'll reap it. You may reap it from other locations. He said, consider me. The guys that were closest to me, the 12 closest men in my life, one of them betrays me, one of them denies me, and nine of them run for their life in my darkest hour. He said, I could have said, Father, send the two legions of angels. Forget it. He said, but I chose to lay my life down for them to love them. He said, now, not only do I have their love, he said, I have many sons and daughters that are pouring their love on me. I remember later on, you know, this was my youth pastor days. This situation occurred. Later on, once I was traveling and speaking, I'd been traveling for 10 years and Lisa and I ministering, and there was a pastor who had probably the most influential church in Europe. And uh, he made comments about me. I had preached for him, and he made comments about me. Uh, he told churches all over the world, he says, John Bevere beats the sheep. He doesn't love the sheep, he beats them up. And, he, and, and I heard his comments from three different continents. 
Now, it was everything I could handle when I was in that youth group for what the man, how the man had slandered me to the whole staff and to the whole church. It was like any, everything I could handle. Now I was hearing my name slandered from three different continents. And do you know that I believe that prepared me for that situation? Because what I did is I wrote him a letter and I blessed him. And I had one of my board members, I just said to him, I said, I want to make sure that I am not crazy. Am I doing the wrong thing or should I go? Because I had literally a man from South Africa call me and go, what is up? Because he knew my heart. He knew. He said he has told. And these were churches that were just about getting ready to invite me to come to their conferences, their nationwide conferences. And then I didn't get any invitations because of, I believe it was because of this man. And I thought, maybe I'm crazy. Maybe I should be calling these churches defending myself, you know? Am I, am I just nuts? And I went to one of my board members, and he's so wise. He said, John, he said, you need to learn from Mr. Moon. I thought, Mr. Moon? I'm thinking, Sun Young Moon? And he says, no, 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 Mr. Moon in the sky. He said, every month the moon comes out, and it's full. And he said, every wolf and coyote and many dogs come out and just howl at that moon. But he said, does the moon answer any of them? He says, he just keeps shining. He said, John, just keep preaching. Do you know that man's influence is totally lost in Europe? The church split. It's not near the church it was. I, I, I was so sad by this because I still really love the guy. I went back to the guy. I, made, I said to him, you know, I, 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 I made things right and... And, and we, we talked together, but it was so sad to see what happened. And um, all those places that I had heard it come from, they ended up asking me to come a few years later. So it prepared me. There are going to be times that people will say things about you. They'll slander and defame your character. The question is, are you going to live by Jesus' personal example and obey your calling? Or are you going to defend yourself? You can defend yourself and win, but you'll miss out on the blessing. The choice is up to you. See you next session.